There was um, like a warehouse area in the back. Yeah. And there were a lot of Bibles there. What happened? Yeah. Well, I have not been to the site. Sergei was just a few days ago, but it's my understanding that the Russian troops uh, went the extra step of taking all that literature and Bibles and Christian ministry material and piling up and setting a bonfire. And it was all burned. And there's some rather, rather dramatic photos of the aftermath of these partially burned Bibles. Welcome to Media Alliance Update. We use these programs to keep you up to date on what God is doing around the world. Our focus for many months has been the war in Ukraine. Media Alliance has held Christian media training conferences in that country for several years, the latest being just over a year ago. As the war continues, many ministries and organizations are stepping in to bring relief to the millions of refugees and displaced families who have scattered to the western part of Ukraine and to the surrounding countries. One such ministry is Mission Eurasia. I had the privilege of serving for several years on the board of this great ministry, but I knew about it for a lot longer than that for their work in Russia back even in the 1990s. Well, today we have invited Sergei Rakhuba, the president of Mission Eurasia, to be with us along with Wayne Shepherd, the chairman of the board for the ministry. And I want to say welcome to both of you, and uh, thanks for joining us here on our program today. Uh, Mission Eurasia, as I mentioned, has been around for quite a while. Sergey, give us just a kind of a brief outline of the ministry itself. Okay, thank you so much, Ron. It's wonderful to be with my boss, Wayne Shepard, on the same <laughs> show. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, we traveled recently together, and uh, I admired Wayne's decision to go into Ukraine, you know, when in the midst of war, visiting some of our ministry places in western parts of uh, Ukraine. Actually, I just got back a couple of days ago uh, from another trip and that constant jet lag feeling, you know, run, you know, travel. <laughs> you are the international traveler, you know what it is. <laughs> but in the last few months, uh, I had to go to the region uh, quite a few times, uh, making sure, you know, so that our ministry is focused uh, and in a full fledged, we are going forward helping people that suffer from this war. You know, Sergey, it's interesting because Mission Eurasia uh, almost had its originating roots in Russia. That's true. You know, actually, our first, uh, you know, original name was Russian Ministries, mm -hmm. Peter Dynecker Russian Ministries. Soon Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, it was the vision. It was a long waiting kind of opportunity. Peter and Anita, our founders, you know, they, they rushed to Russia, to Moscow, mm -hmm. where they uh, started the ministry. And that's where we first met. I'm talking about back in 1989, 1980, even before Soviet Union mm. uh, collapsed as, as a country. Uh, so since then, we were focused on training and mobilizing the next generation of leaders for the evangelical church in the countries of the former Soviet Union. For a number of years, we were based in Moscow in the capital, former capital of the Soviet Union, then later capital of Russia. And that's where we had our ministry center from where we uh, coordinated ministry all across Eurasian uh, countries, former Soviet Union countries. And our main focus to train the next generation. Uh, at the beginning, we were so much involved in church planting and then realized at one point so that the evangelical church in Russia uh, has the biggest need of uh, training or mobilizing their next generation that will take the baton of faithfulness and will continue leading the church into the future. Yeah, and, so, and, and I know you, yeah, you moved your headquarters or your field areas to yeah. Ukraine when it got yeah. to be uh, impossible to continue the work uh, from, from Moscow on that. Yeah. This is, you know, a great question, you know, so that back, you know, when Vladimir Putin came into power, we started realizing that the climate for ministry started changing. We were cooperating with a number of ministries in Moscow, sharing the same office building, Josh McDowell Ministries, Campus Crusade for Christ, Child Evangelism, Russian Christian Radio, and I can name, you know, so there are dozens. When Putin came to power and started kind of bringing this 
uh, his idea of gathering the uh, the power uh, uh, of uh, Russia, you know, again together, as he said, gathering the uh, the empire of uh, uh, Russian uh, Russian Federation. Uh, so he realized, and uh, so that the Western influence and cooperating with the Russian Orthodox Church. They realized all these mission organizations, evangelical mission influence in Russia was on its way, you know, of mm-hmm. his plan to uh, reassemble his uh, uh, power, you know, if I can say through building the Russian empire, rebuilding the Russian empire again. That's when they pushed all the evangelical uh, organizations, mission organizations out. And we were the first ones. And there was a good uh, uh, remark, you know, Ron. So we had to move our office from Moscow to Kiev. Yeah. That's when we modified our uh, assets, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, were able to obtain that building. You visited the building. Right. You know, we had a right. few meetings there, you know. So as a board, you know, you uh, you remember that, that uh, you know, energy you've seen in that yeah. new office, you know, we built uh, just outside of Kiev in a little town of Irpin that became another Colorado Springs of yeah. Ukraine. Yeah, a say. lot of ministries there in that area. Well, you, you talked about um, the leadership among the young adults, young people is one of the facets. Uh, but now with the war in Ukraine, you've kind of taken on another role, and that's in the humanitarian area. Tell us a little bit about the eye care packages and, and what you're doing with that. Yeah, thank you, Ron. It's a good question. You know, so training the young generation, we train them for their practical ministries, for their practical outreach in their communities. And in many, so many cases, you know, so when we going through the training, we train over 20,000 leaders, Mm. young leaders across all the countries of the former Soviet Union. We work, but Ukraine is our hub for our ministry, for all the former Soviet Union territories. So when the war came, uh, we were kind of uh, positioned, you know, so there mm-hmm. all these young people we've trained, they found themselves in the front line of this crisis, helping their local churches that were struggling because of the war. Many church members, congregations, they were uh, getting evacuated, you know, moving vast, you know, uh, crossing the border into surrounding countries. These young people, they stayed there. And they took this baton, baton of faithfulness, and, uh, uh, you know, so that they continued ministry at the front uh, line of the crisis of this war. And this eye care project, actually, we got, uh, you know, quite a bit of experience in it when uh, Russia first invaded uh, Ukraine in eastern parts, in right. Donbass areas there. Uh, so then these young people, we had to do the same thing, but in a lot of in a lot uh, smaller scale. Uh, So this eye care uh, project came as an idea from this young people that they said, we cannot just abandon these areas. Mm. You know, so when the war is raging, we need to help these people that are fleeing from war, that are looking for refuge, they need our help. They mobilized their churches, they mobilized all possible resources we were able to reach out to our uh, supporters here and partnering churches in the West and provided lots of humanitarian aid into the hands of these young leaders that in turn delivered to the needy suffering refugee families and displaced people in Ukraine. That's happened in 2014. Yeah. That's when I care program came into reality. Then. Well, and now, though, it is is exploded because of the deep, deep need that is there. You have an estimate about how much you have uh, distributed as far as food. I know I see these pictures of the people carrying the boxes of things in. Do you have an estimate about how much you've distributed? Uh, we actually don't have an estimate. We have an exact number. Ah. Uh, around, you know. Well, of as course. Of night, you know, preparing for this interview with you. That's you know, my man, I, Sergey, I, right I, there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so as of last night, Ron, we packed and delivered placed into the hands of displaced, needy, and refugee families 82,000 eye care food packages. Mm, One package contains enough food to sustain a family of four or five people for at least one week or more. Mm. Each package, uh, in addition to food, 
And I was told again, you know, allow me to brag a little bit about, uh, you know, our work. And uh, actually, Wayne, thank you. You know, you're paying me for that, right? You, know, so. <laughs> you would expect uh, it. So, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how you do here. <laughs> uh, so each package also contains a copy of scripture, you know, like this Bible, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, this, you know, Ukraine design New Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we already were able to pack and deliver 82 eye care family food packages out of our four packing places in Ukraine. Uh, but as we speak now, our teams are rushing, running eastward, you yeah, know, yeah. places like Nikolaev, Kharkiv, Zaporozhye, Kyiv suburbs, and so on. But in addition to these food packages, by the way, you know, uh, as of last night, we've calculated over a million tons of food been mm. obtained and already oh. delivered. Yeah. Um, again, working with a national church, with local evangelical churches, helping them to utilize all their potential in the midst of this crisis, so they shine with yes. this ministry, you know, helping their communities, preaching the gospel, yeah. you know, so yeah. Yeah. in a very practical way. You know, can I jump? Can I yeah. jump in yeah. here? Ron, because uh -huh. you have to have to realize that all of this is not being done by a large organization. Mission Eurasia is not a large organization, but we have some staff members who not only are victims of the war themselves and are living far from home themselves, but uh, we we have this network uh, of of uh, churches and volunteers that God has raised up over the past thirty years. That we've been training these these young people, school without walls, for this. Uh, you know, not knowing that a war was coming, obviously, but for practical Christian ministry. Yeah. And here it is. Yeah. You know, they're 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 serving under great uh, great difficulty, but doing so without complaint. Um, they're amazing yeah. people. And, and uh, by the way, it's as if God knew that this was coming and would need a, an army right. of these yeah. young people right. to help do that. It's by God's design and plan. And our call, Sergey, is just to be faithful on that. Um, Sergey mentioned the, uh, the headquarters in Air Pen. Such a tragic thing because we were there. It's a beautiful facility, very capable, very accommodating for the needs. And you were there just a few weeks ago after the Russians decimated that whole area. Uh, Ron, you know, just coming back, you know, it was very special. When I first learned, you know, so the building was uh, destroyed, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, I had to accept it, you know. So yeah. there was, you know, seeing pictures, you know, talking to our staff so that we're able to visit that site, talking to our neighbors uh, over the phone. It was one thing, but being there in person and touching that, uh, if you know what I mean, you know, so that the, uh, or I know, standing on a pile of ashes, you know, mm -hmm. realizing that uh, the building was not there. I mean, the walls, you know, yeah. so the, Gone. the skeleton is still there, Gone. but it was totally destroyed by the Russian uh, troops that when they were retrieving, they actually used our building uh, temporarily as their ammunition uh, storage, mm. you know, so for wow. that, all and the units. Wayne, I remember when we were there, there was um, like a warehouse area in the back. Yeah. And there were a lot of Bibles there. What happened? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I've not been to the site. Sergey was just a few days ago, but it's my understanding that the Russian troops uh, went the extra step of taking all that literature and Bibles and Christian ministry material and piling up and setting a bonfire and it was all burned. And there's some rather, rather dramatic photos of the aftermath of these partially burned Bibles. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's a positive side to this too. Sergey knows this well because, uh, Sergey, you have the numbers in your head of how many Bibles uh, have been distributed since that fire. Yeah, we, uh, Wayne, it's a good, good, good remark, you know, so uh, we lost a lot, you know, that warehouse, you know, so that they uh, uh, burned, you know, so had uh, a couple of uh, hundreds of thousands of copies of Christian literature, not just the Bibles. Uh, as of last night, again, uh, getting ready for this uh, interview, we've calculated, you know, over 1.8 million copies of scripture and scripture-based mm -hmm. literature we were able to print. And this is all because of the faithfulness and generosity of our supporters, partners, 
and the family, evangelical uh, family uh, uh, in America, you know, and around the world. Uh, 400,000 copies were already distributed, delivered and placed into the hands of uh, people that are in need. By the way, just to report, so the Bible, the copy of scripture is the most on-demand uh, item today huh. in Ukraine, and that's food for their bodies, you know, for there is a shortage of food, but, you know, for their spiritual comfort, yeah. people are uh, looking for a copy of scripture to have. And that's uh, another thing, you know, people are leaning onto God in the midst of this crisis, yeah. uh, searching for uh, for God to get intervene and bring them Bring them uh, Sergey, I heard that from our mutual friend, Ruslan Kukuchuk, who said people who have never believed in God are turning to God. They're, they're praying to God. They know that it's the only thing they see, it, it would be divine intervention for the war to be ended at this point. And so uh, there is an opportunity. And I'm so glad to hear how Mission Eurasia is stepping into that need with Scripture and God's Word and then having those young people who are reflecting the nature of Christ back to those folks uh, around them. Uh, Wayne, I think you had an opportunity to talk to some of the staff and some of the other people. What did you get a sense of the spirit of the people there? Yeah, I, I want to react to the uh, the people turning to Christ first, if I may, Ron, hmm. because uh, I was interviewed by Secular Television recently, and the interviewer quite, um, uh, I thought, eloquently made a case that, you know, people must be turning away from God at this time. I mean, with all that they're suffering, they, they're, you know, they have to be asking questions of, you know, why would a God allow this sort of thing? And I said, no, it's just the opposite. Hmm. People are turning to God in this crisis. Uh, this suffering, just like we see around the world, that where the church is persecuted the most, that's where the church grows, right? You've seen that. Right. We've all seen that. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that in Ukraine. But back to your question about the staff. Again, I have such great admiration. These people are heroes to me. Um, they are uh, working under difficult circumstances. Many times they're separated from their families. Their families might be in a different country. The The wife and the children may be in a place like Germany or England or or Latvia or something, and the, the, the father is behind uh, working. Uh, we see that happening all the time. Uh, and it is taking an emotional toll. I won't, uh, I won't deny that. But the Lord is sustaining them, and they're doing a great job, and we need to pray for them. I, I think that's the one thing I pray about most often is that God would just encourage them and give them strength to you know, get up mm -hmm. each day and do what, what, they, what they need to do to meet the needs of other victims of this war. One of my purposes for doing these kinds of programs is to solicit the kind of prayer you're talking about. Because when people understand what's going on there, not only the challenges, but the heart of those who are serving, I believe they will be quick to pray. And so uh, yeah, we, yeah. Will, we will do that and encourage folks to continue to pray. And I may ask you, in a, before we wrap up here, maybe the top item on each of your list uh, for prayer in that area, but it's so, so critical. Hey, uh, Sergey, let me ask you kind of a personal question. If I remember, aren't you from Zaporozhye? Yes, I am. That's where actually I was born in Donbass, grew up in Zaporozhye. Yeah. And that's my, I consider my hometown. But, yeah. but uh, the, the, the idea of the conflict with Russia and Ukraine, when you have worked in both of those countries, how do you deal with that personally? Ooh, that's a good question. A very good question, Ron. Uh, this morning I spoke, uh, you know, with our staff uh, in Russia, uh, you know, so, and we have to deal constantly with mm -hmm. this. Uh, there is a, a very deep line of separation, if you know, and it's uh, unfortunately, it's not getting uh, uh, um, better. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we have to deal with it. You know, I not just, you know, born, raised in Ukraine. I lived in Russia, worked in Russia uh, for most of my adult life before, you know, moving to the States back in the uh, beginning of 90s. Uh, so this is still very, very challenging issue and we have to pray. Uh, pray for our Russian brothers, you know, so yes. for uh, ministries in Russia. Uh, uh, you know, people that we work in Russia, very not just sympathetic, you know, very much open and continue praying and helping in the way they can uh, their Ukrainian brothers. But, uh, you know, so the issue of reconciliation, I know, will be uh, taking a long 
that's a, a long time, you know, so before yeah. we reconcile. Uh, that really is a great point to pray for the Russian people. I have sent messages to some of our dear friends in Russia saying we understand leadership is doing something, but we know your heart. And I wanted them to know that we stand with the Russian people who love the Lord. And they may have different viewpoints, but they need to know we're praying for them and for God's will to be accomplished. And I think... I think it'd be pretty easy to see what that is, that this war should end. And yeah. uh, there's a lot of political stuff. We don't need to get into that at all. I think for God to intervene and change people's hearts on, on both sides of the border, but not only there, Wayne, you and I know from travels all over, all over the world. That's the mm -hmm. case all over the world. The, the really, the, the, the way to resolve these things is by doing what you're doing, taking scripture, sharing Christ. People who are asking questions share that the only hope that we have, whether you're in the United States or any place else in the world, is found in Jesus Christ. And so I, yeah. I really applaud you for that. And that's, to me, that's encouraging that the ministry like yours and many others are sensing that and stepping in and providing the physical needs, but at the same time saying this is a unique opportunity for, for a spiritual um, uh, really upgrade for the, in the hearts and lives of the people. Are you sensing that, Wayne? Yeah, indeed. Uh, I, I wanted to point out that uh, on the trip that I made a couple of months ago with Sergei into Ukraine, uh, I was somewhat surprised to learn you know, God has provided trucks for us to actually hmm. get these eye care packages into Ukraine. And I was a bit surprised to learn how deep into the country these drivers, again, they're volunteers, victims themselves, living far from home, but they'll jump in a truck and they'll drive a thousand miles round trip to take a load of boxes, eye care boxes into, uh, in, even into the war zone and on the fringe of the war zone. And many times I spoke with a pastor. Uh, Sergey, I'm thinking of the, of the pastor, the, the Mennonite pastor, who was uh, making this trip twice a week. Hmm. And, and so it wasn't just delivering boxes of food, which is a ministry in and of itself, but he was there for spiritual encouragement and help right. as he went along as well. You know, I, this I, I asked happening the, every day. Yeah, I asked one of the friends that I know that's doing the similar thing going in, and I said, every picture I see, you're smiling. Yeah. And, and, and you know, and I'm thinking, I'd be, I'd be so petrified at going in. He said, <laughs> but he said we must smile. Yeah, those imagine the checkpoints that they have to go through. Oh yeah, yeah. He and, said and those the, and folks the need that encouragement. And, yeah. and so, thank you for what uh, your teams are doing and how they're doing it. That's really that's going to be something that I believe through the years we'll look back and see how God has used some of these things in ways beyond our own imagination. Um, uh, let me ask you, Sarah Gaze, we kind of wrap up here. What do you see for the future of Mission Eurasia? Uh, we know your focus so much now is in Ukraine, but also the other former Soviet countries. Is this changing how Mission Eurasia operates? What do you see? Uh, it does, you know, so in a certain way so that we have to be more prepared, you know, so if there is another crisis like this and we realize that, you know, we've been training young people, you know, so they're ready uh, for situations, you know, like we see now in Ukraine and in other countries, you know, with the recent war in Armenia conflict. Armenia and Azerbaijan and other areas. And with this war in Ukraine, we see that there are possibly even more uh, similar uh, crises, you know, may kind of, uh, you know, expand into other countries, unfortunately, you know, so this is, you mentioned, you know, we're not getting into politics, Ron, you know, <laughs> so, but unfortunately, this seems like, you know, so that may even grow farther uh, beyond the Ukrainian borders. Yeah. And that's what Mission Eurasia is focused on to continue training, preparing the next generation, the leaders of the evangelical church, so that they are ready for the time like this. We're preparing for our school year. Despite, you know, war going in Ukraine, despite of all, you know, everybody is involved now in helping the church to respond to the needs, you know, of their community, their nation. We're preparing, you know, for another school year and we will be training even more people in Ukraine and other countries, you know, surrounding uh, Ukraine in Eurasian countries. Yeah. And uh, this last May run again, you know, in the midst of war, we had over a thousand graduates from School Without Walls. Um, wow. Many yeah. of them 
if they are not even in Ukraine, I'm talking about Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, in Azerbaijan, they're refugees from Ukraine, not necessarily Ukrainian people, but families, uh, yeah. uh, you know, so that ran from Ukraine, ran from war and found the refuge or a safe space in those countries. They are ministering to them. And for the future, that's what we will be focusing more on training next the next generation so that they are ready to continue leading the church and continue preaching the gospel in the midst of any challenges, crises like we see in Ukraine. Meeting with a group, you know, so we support that uh, association of uh, young Christian uh, medical professionals. Ah. So we work with them for a number of years. They, in the time of war, they were able to uh, come together and about 500 young Christian medical professionals are working to mobilize all possible resources to meet the needs, mm. medical needs, uh, of emotional needs of the suffering, uh, displaced, and refugee families. It's, so that's what we continue planning to do. Yeah, it's so amazing to see that great, great work. And I think God is going to use that in tremendous ways. Wayne, let me, uh, as we wrap up, uh, top of your list for prayer, how can we pray uh, for what you've seen, but also for Mission Eurasia? Yeah. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, prayer for the staff who are coordinating all of these volunteers who are doing this great work. Uh, pray for their emotional well-being, for their own spiritual encouragement, for their families who are living apart from them. And remember, these are isn't just in Ukraine that we need to pray for these folks, but we are being uh, we we have uh, ministry centers in Krakow and Warsaw, in Kizanow and Moldova. And these are all people who are working behind the scenes as well, doing the exact same thing, trying to get God's word into Ukraine to meet people's spiritual needs and get them fed uh, physically at the same time. So let's just pray for that staff. Yeah, we will, we will certainly do that. And I'll give you the last word on this, Sergey. What's, what's on the top of your list for prayer? Uh, in addition, you know, to what just Wayne uh, 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 shared, uh, as we speak now, these young volunteer leaders are working with refugee children. You know, so out of 12 million displaced people, they estimate about 50% are children and minors. Mm -hmm. uh, these young ones, you know, so they need, can you imagine, you know, the trauma, mm -hmm. psychological, no. emotional trauma they go through. These young leaders we work with, we, they organize this uh, summer day camps, you know, uh, camps of hope. And as we speak about 20,000 refugee and displaced uh, families, children are spending time in this uh, uh, summer day camps, you know, so that Mission Eurasia national leaders are leading. So the prayer is we continue, we need resources mm -hmm. to accomplish all of this, but pray for these young leaders that touch these young lives working, helping them to uh, recover uh, from their traumas of losing their communities, yeah. their, in many cases, family members, you know, losing peace, you know, and right. so that they are in the safe uh, place uh, arranged by Mission Eurasia national leaders, but, mm -hmm. you know, give them wisdom, courage uh, when they continue working. So pray for the summer camps that Mission Eurasia is leading uh, this summer, uh, helping refugee children in Ukraine. Give, us the, wonderful. give us the website, uh, Wayne, the, where people can go to find out more about Mission Eurasia. Sure. It's missioneurasia.org. Very okay. simply, missioneurasia.org. We're on Facebook and Instagram as well and Twitter. And there are constant updates there on social media, which I find very helpful for prayer every day. Yeah. So I encourage our, our viewers to go there as well. Well, thank you. And thanks to both of you for taking the time and Sergey for recovering enough from your last trip to be able to be with us today as well. <laughs> and uh, we, we appreciate so much the update. It is so critical that we stay focused upon what God is doing to both support and to pray for these uh, really exciting opportunities in spite of the tragic yeah, uh, situation right. that's going on in Ukraine. And as you pointed out, uh, Sergey, to pray for those in Russia. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. And thank you, Ron. You for, Thanks for what you're doing. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. So you. Much, it's a great yeah. team we get to serve together on. If the war in Ukraine lingers, and <laughs> as it lingers, I'm glad there are ministries like Mission Eurasia on the scene.
Yes, providing the food and other items so needed in these days, but also providing that spiritual food and support to help rebuild the spiritual lives of those going through their darkest days. God is shining His light, and Mission Eurasia is helping to direct that light to the hearts of those who need Jesus. Thanks for joining us for another Media Alliance update. I hope you'll watch for the next update as we continue to focus on God and His work around the world. For Media Alliance International, I'm Ron Harris.